All right, everyone. Good evening and welcome. I am Stephanie with Ada Soil and Water Conservation District, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the third class of the Treasure Valley Pollinator Project. This, community, this project is a community-wide citizen science effort to increase pollinator habitat in the Treasure Valley, and thanks to participants like you, we have planted 64,000 flowering plants in yards, gardens, farms, and parks across Ada County and beyond. So on behalf of the bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, hummingbirds, and other pollinators, thank you. Tonight's class is all about how to reduce pesticide use in your home, gardens, and yards, and why you'd want to. Our three wonderful speakers are going to talk to you about how less pesticides means a healthier garden for you, your plants, and all of the creatures who visit it, including pollinators. You will also learn some alternatives to pesticides that really work. So um, just some quick Zoom housekeeping tips before we get started. Um, I'm gonna ask everyone to uh, keep your video off and your audio muted um, so that our speakers can be heard and seen um, by everyone. And at the very end, we're going to have a question and answer session. Um, so at any point in the presentation, you can go ahead and type a question into the chat box, which is along, it should be along the bottom of your screen. You can pull that open and type a question and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, the one exception is our first speaker, Jesso. We're gonna be doing her question and answer right after her presentation. So you if you have any questions for Jessa, go ahead and um, get those entered as soon as you can. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Our first speaker tonight is Jessa K. Cruz. Jessa is the Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist for the Xerxes Society, serving California and the Intermountain West. Since, since joining Xerxes in 2008, she has worked in agricultural and natural lands throughout the Western United States to create habitat for pollinators and other beneficial insects and to promote practi the practices that support them. Jessa holds a Master's of Science in Environmental and environmental entomology and integrated pest management from California State University, Pico, and a bachelor's degree in sustainable farming from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. So Jessica, um, whenever you're ready, I will go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you and welcome. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, everybody. Um, give me a second while I fumble around with the screen share settings over here. Um, give me one second. I'm gonna try to set this up the right way. All right, how does that look? Looks great. Okay, good, thank you. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for taking the time to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Jessica Cruz. I'm the Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist with the Xerces Society. And I am going to be talking um, to you about beneficial insects in your garden. Um, just for those of you who don't know, um, the Xerxes Society is an international nonprofit group. We've been around for over 50 years, um, and we work to protect biodiversity through the conservation of invertebrates um, and their habitats. Um, our motto at Xerxes is protecting the life that sustains us. Um, and that is really our way of saying that we need invertebrates um, just as much as they need us. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking specifically about gardening and this term I refer to as conservation biological control. So I wanted to start with giving you guys a little bit of a context um, and some definitions. Um, when I use the term conservation uh, biological control, what I mean is a practice of attracting and conserving beneficial insects um, by providing habitat and by managing the environment around them. Um, the term, when I use the term beneficial insects, I'm actually referring to three broad groups of insects that are seen as beneficial from a human standpoint. Um, I think that's important um, to mention. Um, and those three really broad groups of what I refer to as beneficial insects would be the natural enemies of crop pests, so insects that prey on other insects. Um, the other broad group, of course, would be pollinators, which I know is very relevant um, for tonight. And the third really broad group, which I really am not going to have time to talk about tonight, but I just want people to kind of think about in the back of their minds, would be our soil-dwelling sort of nutrient 
cyclers. There's a lot going on with invertebrates underneath the soil as well as above it. And um, those invertebrates have a really serious um, impact on uh, soil health. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. But when I say beneficial insects, I'm kind of talking broadly about all of those groups. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is conservation biological control is kind of a mouthful to say. So I often just say CBC, um, just to make it a little bit easier and less of a tongue twister. So if you hear me say that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so again, CBC supports naturally occurring beneficial insects. I think that's important. So I'm not talking about purchasing and releasing insects or anything of that kind. I'm talking about supporting what's kind of already out there naturally, basically by providing um, quality habitat for these insects and by adopting conservation practices. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to be focused on um, talking about this evening. Of course, conservation biocontrol has all kinds of great benefits beyond specifically providing ecosystem services to you in your garden or your farm. Um, the same practices and the same type of habitat that supports beneficial insects also supports wildlife and sort of overall biodiversity. Um, and then, you know, I know most of you are gardeners, but um, from a farming standpoint, um, there is really high consumer demand for products that are produced sustainably, organically, pollinator friendly, all of that, there's a lot of different terms um, for that, but there's really a high consumer demand out there. Um, and then of course, I think particularly relevant tonight just to think about conservation biocontrol as providing good alternatives to insecticide use. Um, and also sort of related to that overall reduced inputs and reduced costs. So, you know, reduced uh, pesticide use, um, improved soil health means not as much need for fertilizers. Um, pollination from native bees means no honeybee hive rentals. So there's lots of ways that CBC is really beneficial um, and sort of seen as a win-win. And then of course it supports natural ecosystems and natural processes. So it's a, a non-invasive form of, um, of management and pest management and pollination overall because it works with natural systems. So I wanna tonight, I, you know, obviously 15 minutes isn't enough to make you all experts in going out to the garden and um, identifying, you know, everything that you see. And I actually really just sort of discourage people from doing that. I sort of refer to that as the insect rabbit hole. Um, don't go down the insect rabbit hole. Don't go out into your garden and try to identify everything that you see. Um, even our most competent and advanced entomologists and taxonomists can't really do that. There are so many different insects out there and without capturing them, pinning them, keying them out under a microscope with a dichotomous key, um, you know, your, your chances of getting a correct identification are, you know, not great. So don't, don't even go there. Um, what I recommend instead, um, and what I generally do in my work is to look for specific insects or insect groups that I know to be beneficial. So I look for them in the landscape or I look for evidence of them in the landscape. And that is really probably a more meaningful way if you're going to be doing scouting. I mean, obviously people scout for pests, insects. So the same way that you might scout for specific pest insects, you know, looking for aphids or looking for scale, I uh, advise the practice of scouting for these beneficial insects in the same kind of way. And so I'm just going to introduce you to some of these insects. I'm really focusing at this point on the ones that I think are e fairly easy to recognize, pretty widespread, things that you're likely to see that also have a really um, big impact on um, ecosystem health, uh, garden health, et cetera. So I'll start with talking about natural enemies, right? That's sort of one group of our beneficial insects. And within that, there's sort of a subcategory of predators. So predators are insects that directly prey on other insects. And I just pulled out six or seven of sort of the most, maybe easy to recognize and widespread predators. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of talk you through them a little bit here. Um, so we've got the um, green lacewing, um, which I think most people would recognize by their sort of iridescent, clear, shiny green wing. Um, this is the adult form here. Hopefully you can see my pointer. Please tell me if you can't see it. Um, 
So yeah, this is the adult lace wing. And then this down here is the larva. And it's important to recognize the larva because it's actually the larva that eat pest insects. So green lace wing larva looks kind of like an alligator uh, with legs. And once you've seen it, um, you'll kind of start seeing it all over the place. And lace wings are just known as being voracious feeders. They eat aphids, leaf hoppers, ligus bug, mealy bugs, small caterpillars, on and on. Um, they eat a lot of different insect pests. They're great to have around. Um, and then we've got, of course, our lady beetles. Sometimes people call them lady bugs, but technically they're actually a type of beetle. Um, I think the adult is pretty easy for people to recognize. Don't get caught up in the spots. Different species have different spots. Some don't have spots at all, but they're generally sort of orange to red and oval. Um, so yeah, if you don't see spots, you're probably still looking at a lady beetle. Um, lady beetle larva. So lady beetles actually both as adults and as larva are predaceous, so they feed on other insects. The adult will also feed on um, pollen and nectar. And they should have said that for a lot of these insects in their adult form, um, they do feed on, um, on nectar as adults and then they're predaceous off, often as larva. And that's important to keep in mind when we start thinking about habitat to support these. Having lots of nectar in your garden will support the adults which in turn will support having um, the larva around. Um, yeah, so back to the lady beetle. So this is an adult lady beetle. The lady beetle larva, um, again, kind of have a similar shape to the lace wing larva. Um, they also kind of look like a little mini tiny little alligator with legs. Um, but the lady beetle larva has these orange, they're usually black with these orange stripes. There's two parallel orange stripes on either side. And again, once you've seen them, they're pretty distinct looking. Um, and they're pretty small, but not, but you can still see them with the naked eye. The minute pirate bug down here, um, we like to say minute pirate bug is tiny, but mighty. Um, they're very, very small, um, barely able to see with a naked eye, or if you're kind of getting older like me, you need a hand lens to really see them. Um, and they eat surprising amounts for their size, they eat surprising amounts of food. Um, they will even prey on insects that are, you know, easily twice their body size, like leaf hoppers, mites. They go after um, small things as well, caterpillars, thrips, et cetera. They can kind of be recognized by this coloration pattern. So you see this kind of black on their thorax and then some black, almost diamonds on their wingtips. So it almost forms uh, like three black, I guess not diamonds, I guess three black triangles. And then the space in between is this kind of iridescent gold and cream. So again, looking for these three black triangles, it takes, for me, I need a hand lens to see it, but once you've seen them, they're pretty distinct looking. Not too many other insects really have that same color pattern. So that will help you uh, recognize them out in your landscape. And then over here, this one often surprises people. This is actually a photograph of a wasp, a predaceous wasp. So many of our social wasps, our vespids and species wasps um, that you would see out in the landscape are actually predaceous. So the adults in this case will go and hunt prey to feed to their developing larva. So the larva stay in the nest, they're protected, but the adults go out on the landscape looking for food, they catch prey and bring it back to the larva. And so even though a lot of people are a little bit fearful of wasps, they can actually be really good to have around. Um, next broad group is spiders. Uh, um, I recognize, and probably all of you know, technically speaking, a spider is not an insect. <clears throat> they're kind of in their own um, classification, but I included them just because they're so good to have around. They prey on all kinds of other pest insects. They're one of the first beneficials that will move into an area. Um, and so seeing large numbers of spiders out in your garden is really often a sign of good garden health if you've got these spiders around. Not spider mites, but spiders. Um, and then finally, the surfid fly, um, also known as a hoverfly or flower fly, it goes by many different names. It's what we call a bee mimic. So the coloration makes it look a lot like a bee. Um, and it actually is a decent pollinator as an adult because of the way that it feeds on nectar. It tends to spread pollen around. Um, but the larvae um, of surface flies are very good predators. 
The larva are hard to find, so we didn't really include a picture of them here. They're very cryptic um, and kind of nondescript. So I would advise looking for the adult. Wherever you have robust populations of adults, you're gonna have some larva around. Um, so that's just like a really quick introduction and overview to some of the predators that you might see out in your landscape. Another group of great predators would be uh, the ground beetles. These are um, carabid beetles. Uh, that's the group that they belong to. They're generally ground dwelling, so they live under debris or down in the soil. Um, they come out at night and they hunt. They're particularly well known for eating pest caterpillars or other pest beetles. Um, they're pretty large um, and they're really good hunters. One way to see if you've got them in your garden is actually that you can set up a really simple pitfall trap using like a, a solo cup or some other cup that's smooth sided, dig it down into the soil so the top is flat, flush um, with the, with the um, top of your soil with the level of the soil. And when these uh, ground beetles come out at night, they kind of start crawling around the garden. They'll fall into the cup. They won't be able to get out. You can come out in the morning and see how many you caught. And that way you can tell if you've got ground beetles around in your garden uh, and no harm done. They might be a little irritated that they spent the night in a cup, um, but they won't be harmed and you can just let them go. Um, so it's really just a way to, to look and see if they're around and it's, it's pretty fun. Um, another sort of broad group. So those are just some of the many, many different predators. And I will emphasize there are so many others. I was just focusing on ones that, you know, maybe are easy to find, easy to look for. Um, so those are predators. Those are insects that prey directly on other insects. We've also got these parasitoids. So parasitoids, mostly wasps or flies, um, are insects that lay their eggs either inside or on top of the body of their host. So this is a caterpillar that has been parasitized um, by a wasp. And then this picture is actually um, a wasp that is in the act of parasitizing an aphid. So they're actually using the ovipositor to pierce a little hole inside that aphid and lay their eggs in the body of the aphid. In both of these scenarios, once those eggs hatch, the larva basically eats the host alive. It just consumes the entire host. Um, so it's a little bit gruesome, but kind of fascinating and extremely effective. Um, many parasitoids are kind of specialists, so they'll go after specific pest insects or specific groups of insects. So it's sort of nice to have them around if you have a, a very particular insect problem. Most um, parasitic insects, especially the parasitic wasps, are very tiny. If you look at the slide, um, this is a parasitic wasp uh, and this is an aphid. So they're almost the same size and you all know how small aphids are. So it's kind of hard, they're hard to see. So what I actually recommend is looking for evidence of parasitism rather than looking for um, the, the wasp itself. Um, so this scenario where you've got um, this aphid being parasitized, you've all seen what aphids look like when they're healthy, they're kind of plump and green and squishy and a little bit shiny. So if you see aphids go from looking that way to kind of looking this way, what's pictured in the slide, where they're, they're basically what we call mummified. They're just empty brown shells because they have been parasitized. That larva has hatched and eaten the body of the aphid and all that's left is a shell. So if you start seeing aphids that go from looking green to looking kind of brown and crusty and dried out, you probably have parasitic wasps or some kind of parasites in your garden. And in that case, that's a good thing, unless you want to have aphids around, but most of us don't, because if you have aphids, <laughs> you want to have a lot of flowers or vegetables. So again, looking for the evidence of the parasitism is sometimes the best way uh, to identify them. Really briefly, of course, our other really broad group of beneficial insects are pollinators. I'm focused here on native bees. Of course, other insects can be pollinators, certainly butterflies as well. Um, but just in the bee world alone, there's over 4,000 different species of native bees. And I think it's just important to say that they don't all look alike and they don't all really look like honeybees. You can kind of see on the slide just a, a handful. Um, they can be gray, they can be yellow, they can be black, they can be fuzzy, they can be shiny. Some of them are iridescent green. So 
I guess the best tip I can give you if you're looking to see, do I have native bees in my garden? The kind of quick and dirty thing is that most females, not the males, the females will be actively seen collecting or transporting pollen. So if you see an insect with like a large amount of pollen stuck on their body, either on their abdomen or on the legs, on their scopa, you can kind of see in this one, see an insect that kind of looks like a bee, has a lot of pollen on it or is carrying pollen or is gathering pollen, it probably is a bee. And I just kind of want to wrap up by just talking about the need for conservation. So, you know, I approach a lot of my work in terms of ecosystem services, telling people, hey, you know, pollinators are beneficial to have around. Native pollinators are going to pollinate your crops. Um, predators and parasitoids are great to have around. They're, they're natural enemies. They're, they're going to go after your crop pests. And all of that is true. But what is also true um, is that our insects are in severe decline across the board. And, you know, insects are really like the foundation of our, our food web. Um, without insects, everything above them starts to collapse. Um, a recent study determined that in the last 75 years, we've lost over 50% um, of our insect populations across the board. That's a huge decline. Of course, people are also very focused on pollinators. Um, so just a few more statistics. 28% um, of our bumblebee species are now currently classified as threatened. 17% um, of our North American butterflies are at risk. And as a lot of you know, um, the Western monarch has kind of been on everybody's mind lately. They have undergone a 99.9% .9 population decline in the past several decades. Um, and they are really in a lot of trouble. So anything that you can do to help these insects won't just help your garden, but will really help insect biodiversity as a whole, which is hugely important. Um, there's a lot of factors that contribute to pollinator declines. I won't obviously have time to go into detail, um, but habitat loss and degradation obviously playing a huge role. Um, pesticides, without a doubt, um, really problematic for insects. And then climate change um, in a whole lot of very complex ways is definitely contributing as well. I think those are probably like the three big ones. There's lots of other impacts, but those to me are the probably the, the three largest contributing factors to pollinator declines and really insect declines across the board. Um, I'm gonna, so I just wanted to mention habitat kind of referred to it this talk hasn't really been focused on the habitat, it's been focused on the insects. But I just want to remind people that basically insects, most of these insects that I talk about, they need pollen and nectar. So flowering plants, especially native flowering plants are really important. Uh, they need shelter. So um, overwintering and egg laying, so bunch grasses, shrubs, um, tree stumps, rock piles, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of uh, things like that can provide good overwintering shelter um, for a lot of these beneficial insects. Um, and that they also obviously require uh, protection and refuge from pesticides. So if you're going to create this habitat for insects, you obviously want to protect it from pesticides. Um, and we have so much data, both anecdotal and also, you know, research data showing this very direct link um, between habitat and beneficial insect uh, abundance and diversity. So it really uh, does work. Um, I just wanted to point you in the direction of a couple of resources here. Um, maybe I forgot to ask this earlier, but maybe Stephanie or someone can share these links or this slide later so you're not trying to quickly write it all down or screen share it or you can take a photo of it. Um, but we have, it's a couple different um, places on our website where you can get specific information about um, using pesticides or, or not using pesticides in your garden, um, and then just general pollinator conservation in your garden. Um, so these two links, the top and bottom link will take you to those. And then this middle link is actually a scouting guide. So some of the insects that I went over today really quickly, that the pollinator groups and the other beneficial insect groups, we actually have like a guide 
that helps give you ideas of how to recognize them and a specific protocol um, that you can use, you know, in your, in any landscape, garden, park, natural area, farm, sort of meant to be used um, with a lot of different applications. So you can check out that guide um, as well for more information. So um, that is all that I've got for you folks today. I'm gonna stop my share. Um, and I thank you again for, um, yeah, for joining us this evening. And I'm trying to get back to the screen. Here we go. So that I can see if there's any questions in the chat box. Here we go. Got one. It says, should we consider caterpillars as beneficial since they eventually turn into pollinators? Yeah. So whether something is beneficial or not completely depends on the context. And not all caterpillars um, turn into butterflies that pollinate. So um, there's, they really run the gamut. So um, I would say if you see a caterpillar, try to figure out what kind of caterpillar it is. Uh, if it's tomato hornworm you, and you grow tomatoes, you might not want to have that around. Um, however, when tomato hornworms grow up, they're beautiful sphinx moths, which people are fascinated by. And if you don't have tomatoes, maybe they're fine. So really what's a pest and what's not a pest is totally context dependent. Um, yeah, that's the best I can answer that one. Any other questions? Um, Jessa, this is Stephanie. Sorry, everyone. I realized that I did not have my video on for the introduction, so you'll miss the nice picture of the bee behind me. I don't know which way to go so that you can see it. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm not able to see the chat for some reason on my screen, um, but I was going to ask a quick question um, or um, and also just make a comment. Um, firstly, thanks so much for your presentation. It was really great. Um, and it is remarkable that the the monarch butterfly has declined that much, 99.9% .9 in the past several decades. Um, I did want to mention, we've told our participants about this citizen science project before, um, but the monarch milkweed mapper um, is a really great project that you can get involved in and um, through citizen science. And I'll go ahead and share that um, link in the chat. I'll also share all of those resources that you um, had at the end of your slide with everyone. So. Um, we'll share those with our participants. And then um, I kind of wanted to ask you really quick about earwigs. Um, I've noticed like more than any other year, I've had, I have a bunch of earwigs um, in my garden. And I was wondering if there's different, like, because it's been so hot, I don't know if different climate conditions can cause the proliferation of like certain pests over others. I don't know specifically about earwigs. I mean, the one that comes to mind right away in terms of climate is that drought really favors grasshoppers. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard on the news about these massive grasshopper outbreaks. And that's definitely related to drought. Um, generally speaking, drought doesn't favor most insects. Um, so, that, you know, or an or an extreme, extremes in general don't usually favor most insects, but you know, there are outliers. I think with earwigs, I mean, I don't think that heat would actually promote large populations unless it just means that they were able to start reproducing earlier in the season. So their populations are just building up faster. Like that is a possibility. Earwigs and sow bugs and other insects in that category, they, they can, earwigs in particular, can be pests, but they are also soil dwellers and also somewhat nutrient recyclers because um, they're detritivores, so they break down, you know, dead material. Um, so I always kind of think of them as like, hey, if they're not really causing a problem, try to tolerate them. But obviously, sometimes when large populations, they can decimate a vegetable garden. So um, again, depends on the context. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions for Jessa? Do you see any in the chat? I don't know why it's not showing up. Um, yeah, I only saw the one. I don't see any others. So, and people can follow up via email too if there are more questions, because I know we've got two more speakers to go and I, I fear I might have gone over time. 
Um, so I'm going to mute myself and try to listen to the other speakers until I need to leave. But I, again, I just want to thank um, both the other speakers and Stephanie and all of you for being here tonight. It was uh, fun to chat about um, good bugs. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. We'll go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Sherilyn Peterson. Sherilyn joined the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides as the Healthy Wildlife and Water Conservation and Water Coordinator in 2020. She holds a, a master's degree in forestry from Northern Arizona University focusing on forest health and a bachelor's of science degree in commercial photography and anthropology. Before joining NCAP, Sherilyn worked for several state and federal agencies, universities, and nonprofits where she advocated for wildlife habitat and sustainable land management. Sherilyn keeps busy running her small eco farm with her husband and providing local communities with heirloom, fresh cut flowers, vegetables, and botanical products, playing with her three dogs, practicing yoga, and riding her bicycle. So I'm going to share her presentation on my screen. Give me just a moment to pull that up. And then I'll pass it on. Let's see. All right. Everyone see that? I hope. Okay, so Sherilyn, um, go ahead uh, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you all so much for, for being here and also to Ada Soil and Water Conservation for having me in the webinar tonight. I'm very happy to be able to talk to all of you. So I'd like to just tell you a bit more about my background. Um, Stephanie told you a little bit about myself um, and why I'm here talking to you today. As a wildlife biologist, I was constantly concerned with the practices of the natural resource agencies I worked for and how actions such as pesticide spraying affected wildlife and their habitat, as well as my health and my coworkers' health. It was a welcome change coming to NCAP as I was able to advocate for changing pesticide use practices and encouraging the use of safe alternatives. My talk tonight will focus on the bigger picture of pesticide impacts on the environment, looking at specific impacts to air, water, wildlife, and human health. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to give you a short introduction to the organization that I work for. The Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides, or NCAP for short, is a nonprofit founded in 1977, and this was from a wellspring of community-based groups that were working on healthier forest management practices such as aerial forest spraying in Oregon and Washington. Our mission is to protect community and environmental health and to inspire the use of ecologically sound solutions to reduce the use of pesticides. We have three program areas. Uh, the first one is healthy food and farms. The second is healthy people and communities. And in my program area, which is healthy wildlife and water. And we have six campaigns that fall below those. Next slide, please. So first off, um, the history of pesticide use is, is extremely long. For the sake of time today though, I will start at the turn of the 20th century, where inorganic synthetic materials such as arsenic-based insecticides arriving in the US from Europe in 1860. And then the synthesis of DDT, an organochlorine insecticide, was completed in 1874. Dow Chemicals was founded in 1897 they began producing bleach and quickly diversified to chemicals and later nuclear weapons. Monsanto was founded in 1901. They began producing sweeteners, caffeine, vanilla, medical drugs, and later chemicals and synthetics. 1945, after World War II, DDT was introduced for public use and we began seeing the start of environmental degradation and an increase in chemical inputs into the environment with manufacturing of Agent Orange in 1950, the patenting of chlorpyrifos in 1966. There wasn't regulation of the use of pesticides until the EPA was established in 1970, and pesticides began to be registered. In 1974, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, was first registered by the EPA. Next slide, please. Pesticide contamination in the air is a considerable pollution of factor that causes hazardous impacts on flora, 
fauna, and human health. Agricultural activities, as you see in the photo here, often spray drift in the air, and the residues of pesticides in the air are mainly from pesticide application or by volatilization, evaporation, and transpiration from soil or plants. A significant fraction of applied pesticides, about 15 to 40 percent, is dispersed in the atmosphere through spray drift or volatilization processes. Next slide. Pesticides can enter both surface water and groundwater by direct application for the control of aquatic weeds and aquatic insects. Percolation, drift, and runoff from agricultural production fields, plant nurseries, and landscaping efforts. Groundwater is polluted when pesticides leach from areas such as treated fields, mix and wash sites, or waste disposal areas. Surface water systems, including rivers, lakes, streams, reservoirs, and estuaries, are especially vulnerable to the accumulation of pesticides and other chemicals. Uh, surface water systems are linked to both, I'm sorry, can you go back? Sorry, I wasn't quite done. Thank you. Uh, surface water systems are linked to both groundwater and atmospheric water through the hydrologic cycle. Furthermore, pesticides in surface water can be transferred to groundwater through seepage of the soil. Pesticide mobility in water results in contamination of water resources, such as wildlife habitat and drinking water. Next slide. Pesticides disrupt soil communities, killing beneficial soil microorganisms like earthworms and other insects, causing low fertility of the soil. Maintaining the right balance between bacterial and fungal populations in the soil is important for capturing more carbon especially right now as we're dealing with climate change. Uh, pesticides can produce the opposite, increasing the proportion of bacterial to fungal populations in soil. Some pesticides can alter biochemical processes, interfering with enzyme production, inhibiting some while stimulating others, thus altering soil fertility, nutrient cycling, and metabolism. Scientific evidence demonstrates that some pesticides can also hinder nitrogen fixation, by inhibiting molecular communication between plants and the bacteria that fix nitrogen inside legume roots, and by diminishing root growth and reducing the number of root sites available for essential nitrogen fixing bacteria. Next slide. So pesticide applications are toxic to both target and non-target plants. Pesticides have direct harmful effects on plants, including poor root hair development, shoot yellowing, and reduced plant growth. Pesticide toxicity results in a reduction of chlorophyll, causing plants to absorb less energy and receive less nutrients from sunlight, leading to decreased photosynthetic efficiency. Protein contents are also reduced when plants are exposed to pesticide applications as amino acids necessary for plant growth and development are compromised. Plant biodiversity is threatened by pesticide use as spray drift can land on non-target plants, causing physical damage such as chemical burns and plant mortality. Next slide, please. So looking specifically at the or organophosphate class of pesticides as they are most often used in the United States. Organophosphates have been implicated in 335 separate mortality events, causing the deaths of over 9,000 birds in the U.S. between the years of 1980 and 2000. Non-target wildlife are frequently exposed because these compounds primarily act by inhibiting an enzyme found at synapses within the central and peripheral nervous systems, the potential for altering physiological and behavioral responses essential for survival and reproduction in exposed animals is great. The effects of acute but sublethal exposure of wildlife to organophosphates impact thermoregulation leading to hypothermia, food consumption leading to anorexia and altered foraging behaviors, and reproduction leading to altered hormone levels, reductions in clutch and litter size, and alterations in reproductive behavior. Next slide, please. Um, so lastly, looking at the human component of the environment, uh, pesticides impact humans through environmental contamination, 
such as direct exposure to spray drift and through food contaminated with pesticide residue. Acute effects occur from pesticide drift from agricultural fields, exposure to pesticides during application, and intentional or unintentional poisoning generally leads to acute illness in humans. Symptoms of acute illness in humans can include anything from stinging eyes, rashes, blisters, blindness, nausea, dizziness, diarrhea, or even death. Chronic effects are from prolonged exposure and are much more serious, and they include cancers, birth defects, reproductive harm, neurological and developmental toxicity, immunotoxicity, and disruption of the endocrine system. And the picture on the right top um, is showing some of the skin problems that are caused by pesticide exposure. And this would be considered probably, a, well, really an acute effect, but depending on how long they've been exposed, it could be a chronic effect. Um, next slide. So I just wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, this is my personal email address at NCAP. Um, as well as our website link. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about pesticides or alternatives or if you'd like any kind of consultation. And I thank you again. All right, thank you so much, Sherilyn, for that presentation. Um, a lot of the times when we use pesticides, um, especially on smaller scale, we just kind of focus on the fact that it got rid of the bugs that we might not have wanted. Um, and I think it's so important to see the bigger picture um, and to see the widespread effects that pesticides can have on everything from, you know, water to air to human health and plant health and um, wildlife and all of that. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think it's important to know that we're all connected. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we like to say a lot. Um, and I know I've encountered a lot of folks in my line of work that don't necessarily see that connection. And it, it's, it's a really strong one. Um, and yes, every, every action that you do has an action on something else. So, yeah. yeah thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And let's see. I can turn my video back on. There we go. <laughs> All right, so now we'll go ahead to our final speaker this evening is Lindsay Schramm. Lindsay Schramm has owned North End Organic Nursery in Garden City for 10 years. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Northern Arizona University, which led her to study how nutrition starts with the soil. After graduating, she started an organic farm in Northern Arizona and began to study soil biology under Dr. Elaine Ingham. Understanding the soil food web and the interaction of soil microbes and organic practices ultimately led her to opening NEON in 2010. Her education continues daily as she helps organic gardeners understand the complexities of gardening without synthetic chemicals in the Inner Mountain West. So Lindsay, we'll go ahead and welcome you and you can go ahead and be there whenever you're ready. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna do a screen share here as well. Um, let's see if I can get this to come up properly. And from beginning, let's see, are we gonna do this? From beginning there we go how's does it look all right looks great you can hear me too yes okay i apologize i'm at a remote location so if, if you hear a bunch of people walking into the door a bunch of kids screaming it's my daughter's softball end of the year party <laughs> going on in the background um so thank you for having me here today i'm looking forward to sharing a little bit of this with you I'm, it's not a super long presentation so um, just, uh, I'm going to go through it. If anybody has questions, um, I'm sure I can be notified since I'm just looking at the screen here. If you, if you let me know if anybody has any questions, that'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about managing your garden without using pesticides. Um, and at the very least using minimal impact pesticides that are organic and specific. Um, so the big important thing here when we're talking about managing a garden is that the management is actually multifaceted and pesticides don't know when to stop killing. 
So even organic ones are not just going to go after the target species that you are trying to get. Um, at least not all organic ones are going to just go after that one thing. You can be very targeted with organic pesticides, but still, if you're just going through and spraying your garden, you're gonna be killing the guys that are also trying to help and do a lot of the heavy lifting of maintaining a good ecosystem in your garden and just getting rid of unnecessary non-pests. Uh, non so giving yourself an ounce of prevention is so much um, a part of the picture. A pesticide-free gardening, a pesticide-free gardening works on the principle of prevention rather than the cure. Um, by always maintaining a healthy, active soil with plenty of nutrients, you use compost and manures to enrich in the soil and add lots of carbon and soil biology and diversity. Crop rotation when necessary. I don't always crop rotate. Um, if something is doing extraordinarily well then I also believe that there is a, if things are healthy, then you're actually um, creating a healthy soil structure specific to that plant. And by moving another plant into its place that has a different collection of um, uh, microorganisms at it in, a, in its microbiome that might not be similar to the previous plant, it's not actually doing anybody a service, but if you've got issues, then it's a really good idea to do crop rotation. Um, a weak, malnourished, or stressed plant will attract more pests than a healthy one. It's just like with uh, humans or animals or herd animals that you always have the weakest ones get cold. And well, I shouldn't say that about humans. We try not to cull our weakest ones, but that's just unique to humans. <laughs> For the rest of the living world, the weakest go. And uh, with plants, that's the same. You're often going to see pests attack plants that are not thriving. And um, they'll, they might go after some of the healthy ones, but they won't really make as much of an impact. Uh, and you won't necessarily see the damage that you'll see on a sickly plant. So by attending to the soil, making sure things are watered, making sure things that are placed in the right location with enough sun, enough space, uh, that is number one for creating an environment that doesn't require pesticides. Um, healthy plants can often fend for themselves. And so, but at the other end of the spectrum, if you over fertilize, that is also kind of like a beacon for certain pests, especially aphids, um, because they like that overly nitrogen rich foliage and that sends off its own scent markers that will attract pests. So you have to Feed your plants a four course meal, I like to say. Don't give them an excessive amount of sugar and sweets, which would be high nitrogen fertilizers. Um, make sure that they're eating everything on their plate and they're getting all their micronutrients and their, you know, their nitrogen, their phosphorus, their potassium, their calcium. Make sure that everything's going into the soil and then they should be able to fend for themselves a lot better. Uh, companion planting is a great way to go about uh, creating an environment that just naturally doesn't attract pests. So for instance, did you know that raspberries and potatoes host similar pests and disease? You wouldn't think they would because they're really not related in any way, but they do. And so planting potatoes and raspberries near one another can generally attract the same pests that don't have then far to travel to find another host once they're done uh, saturating the, the first host they found. So you, what you want to do is create an environment that confuses potential pests to say, well, I've got this plant over here that I really like, but this one next to it smells weird and it doesn't taste as good as I like. So, you know, maybe I'm not going to put a lot of energy into reproducing and spreading out here because I don't have far to spread. So companion planting uses the knowledge of natural plant partnerships as well as adversarial, I don't know if I spelled that right, um, relationships to plan out garden space. So you can plan stuff for, you know, keeping some of the weeds out or um, planting smelly things like basil and onions and garlic in and amongst your other plants that do attract pests more readily. Um, it helps to deter them. So lots of herbs and flowers and marigolds intermixed in with plants that tend to take on a heavy pest burden is a great way to decrease the pest world's ability to detect and find uh, what they're looking for. Uh, lots of information on the internet about companion planting, but it is a great one. That top picture that I have there is of a three sisters garden. So this is another situation where they're trying, uh, one of the things in the three sisters garden is to detract away from uh, raccoons because raccoons don't like stepping on the semi prickly leaves of squash and cucurbit plants. So that's another way to do that. Um, treat your garden as an exclusive hangout, and you can use inexpensive and reusable barriers like floating, row, like floating row cover and keep out the very front. So you can keep your plants covered up for a certain portion of the year using this really awesome tool 
that requires zero pesticides and it keeps things like um, cabbage looper, uh, flea beetle, uh, several other, you know, grasshoppers, several other leaf hopper and, and hopping insects. It just keeps them out. It warms the soil, especially early spring and into the fall. Um, it lets light and water through. So there's really no downside, in my opinion, until it gets hot. And of course, at that point, they have a semi greenhouse effect and you don't want to keep them on when your plants are getting too hot. But your plants grow so much faster in the spring and fall when they're kept covered with a floating row cover that acts as also a frost blanket. Um, remember that you have friends in low and high places. Plant a diverse garden rich in pollinator friendly plants and herbs and you can welcome in your allies. Uh, avoid monocultures when possible because monocultures are going to be a smorgasbord for one particular pest and they will call all their friends. Uh, holding back and react, uh, please hold back and react uh, from reacting to a pest problem that allows your aid team time to rally and help your cause. At a particular time every year, the store gets flooded with people with aphids on their roses and they all want something to spray it with. And when possible, I try to say, come back in a week and tell me if you still have an aphid problem. And if you do, I'll recommend something because often the aphids are kind of the um, warning signal that all of your uh, ladybugs and lady, you know, lady beetles are going to start emerging and they will start breaking them down. I haven't sprayed for aphids in a very long time, uh, except for Brussels sprouts and kale. I often have to do something there. There's just not enough ladybugs in the world for them. But if you stand back and just wait and see what other natural cycles and predators come along to take care of a pest problem for you. Now, of course, if you're getting decimated just you know, overnight, then you might have to do something a little bit more proactive. But if you're just noticing evidence of pests in your garden, don't do anything just yet. See if maybe they don't eat that much and if other predators come in and take care of them for you. And so get to know your local bug eaters and create a habitat for them whenever, whenever it's possible. So creating spaces where they can hide and hang out, um, lots of pollinator friendly plants, places for, you know, build bat houses, you can build, uh, you know, barn swallow houses, different things that are going to attract specifically insect eating uh, predators. For biologicals, we're talking about for controlling things like disease and some larval stages of bugs. So biologicals are basically good bugs to help fight bad bugs. And I put that in quotes because, you know, there's no such thing as a bad bug. Um, and there's just bugs that like our plants as much as we do. But um, we don't, we want to be selfish and keep our plants to ourselves. So we have to keep those quote unquote bad bugs at bay. Beneficial nematodes are a great way to control things like black vine weevil, um, bill bugs in your lawn, uh, other types of soil dwelling uh, organisms, sorry, soil dwelling grubs. It's also really got good for coddling moth in fruit trees. Um, if you put down beneficial nematodes in the fall and in the spring, they actually can help parasitize some of the coddling moth larvae that are in the soil. There's products like Bacillus thuringiensis, also known as BT, um, that can be used to spray on plants where caterpillars are trying to eat them. Now, that's always a delicate balance there because caterpillars have become butterflies. So um, it's always nice to sacrifice a little bit of your garden to caterpillars. But again, if things are getting decimated, oops, didn't mean to do that, then you might have to pull out some big guns. Um, Bacillus amylopapacins, I'm not confident in my pronunciation, but it's as close as I'm going to get. That is great for bacterial and fungal diseases. And that's what's in that Monterey disease control product that I have showing on the screen. I love using uh, these kinds of products because I'm adding life to help keep life in check. Um, it's not a side, C-I-D-E, but it is a predator that we're introducing. Same thing with Bacillus subtilis, which is great for fungal diseases, as is the Bacillus amyloquefacens in the Monterey disease control. Um, also beneficial insects like lady beetles, praying mantis, lace wings, and more. You can introduce them into your garden spaces if you do not see enough of them present on their own. If you, oops, if you don't know what's eating your garden, you might want to play a little hide and seek. Um, my mom always said nothing good ever happens after midnight. And <laughs> that, that often seems to be the case with the uh, insect world. So a lot of times things that are eating your plants that are showing their evidence during the day are not visible during the day. And you, people come into the store all the time and they're like, what's eating this plant? I don't see anything. And a lot of times it's some of these uh, insects that like to come out at night. So you might want to take a flashlight out in the evenings if you're seeing damage to any of your plants and get a, an ID on what is actually going after it. 
When a control is needed, make sure that you know what you are controlling, there, where it lives and when it is eating. So um, of course, always choose something labeled as organic, but why? So the whole idea with organics is that you are adding something that is naturally derived um, in limited quantities most of the time, uh, hopefully at least, um, and it should be have a shorter lifespan of how long it is active and it should also be more specific. Now there are some broad spectrum um, organics, but again, I just, at least me personally, when people come into the nursery looking to kill something, I try to help them figure out a way around it. Um, and at the very last resort, here's something that you can selectively use at the right time, especially when you're talking about flowering plants. Flowering plants, um, you know, obviously will have bees and other uh, pollinators. So you want to make sure that if you have to spray a flowering plant with an organic product like neem or, uh, you know, pyrethrins or whatever, you're doing it after dusk once all of the pollinators have gone to bed. Uh, it's also preferable to choose stuff like baits, traps, and pathway interrupters at first. So baits being something like Sluggo Plus, um, traps being like soy sauce traps if you've got, you know, earwigs. Also, the Sluggo Plus is great for that. And pathway interrupters, and if, if you see in the lower right-hand corner, it's in it, somebody spreading out diatomaceous earth around specific plants so that when soft-bodied insects crossed over that barrier, that will slice and dice and dehydrate them to death. Isn't that lovely? Make sure you understand how your controls work. What is the mode of action? What is it doing? For instance, neem is a three-way, it's a miticide, insecticide, and fungicide. And the way it works and what makes it kind of a neat product to use when you need to use something like this is the fact that it must be consumed by the, by the insect eating the plant in order for it to kill it. So if you spray the plant and then a ladybug comes by later, it won't do anything to the ladybug. It must be consumed and then it acts as a life cycle disruptor. That's all I've got today, folks. Anybody have any questions? Thanks so much, Lindsay, for that presentation. <laughs> that was great. To the um, point. I <laughs> yeah, um, we can go ahead. If anyone has any questions, um, we're kind of at time, but if anyone has any questions, they could type them into the chat um, and we can get to them. Um, I'll give people just a second to do that. Um, I was gonna, make a quick comment um one of the we planted a bed of um, lettuce and then right next to it a bed of kale and um there were quite a few aphids on the lettuce by the end of it um which mm -hmm. i was kind of surprised at um and there weren't any on the kale and i was like huh that's weird because usually aphids love kale so what's oh absolutely on? and i was thinking when you said you can over fertilization can attract pests um, we did, fer we fertilized the lettuce when we planted it, um, but we didn't the next bed with the kale. So I'm wondering if that could have had anything to do with it. That was pretty interesting. It, it certainly could have. I mean, um, did, did the uh, lettuce look like it was really big and green and lush? Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that definitely could have been it. it you know, it was as delicious to you as it was to the aphids. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you can't do anything about that. And some, I mean, but it, at, especially if you're doing an organic fertilizer, you know, you really want your plants to grow big and healthy and strong. So um, that was just one of those situations where they, they got in on the, uh, on the good stuff. Yep. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not seeing anyone type any questions in. Um, we will, we are recording this uh, class and we will be posting it for everyone who couldn't make it. So some questions might pop up later. Sounds uh, good. And then, yeah, so I just wanted to thank all of our speakers for being here tonight. Jessa, Sherilyn, and Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the time um, to be here. And thanks for everyone who, who participated for being here as well. And I wanted to remind everyone that we have our Pollinator Festival this Saturday, July 10th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Peaceful Belly Farm in Caldwell. It's gonna be a lot of fun. We'll have some local artisans, some live music, some activities for the kids. Um, I think they're gonna have a, a honey themed menu at Peaceful Belly. So it's gonna be great, come on out. It'll be before it's too hot. So that'll be nice too. So, all right, so thanks everyone and have a good rest of your evening.